<clears throat> hello, hello, hello everyone. Kamusta kay Jan? Happy Monday. Hope you had a, a great respite over the weekend with family and loved ones. Ayan, balikan natin ang news latest pagdating sa Pilipinas. And of course, once again, foreign policy, in particular the West Philippine Sea issue, is at the heart of our political discussion ngayon. Medyo nagtitrending na yung Ayungin Shoal, also internationally known as the second Thomas Shoal. Hindi ko na yung Chinese name niya. But, you know, hindi naman talaga sa China yan. Um, and, uh, of course, pag-usapan natin ang implication na ito, especially for Uniteam. Because, of course, last week, uh, we talked about how supposedly the Uniteam is still united. If you look at the interaction between Marcos Jr. and President Duterte, former President Duterte and President Marcos Jr. dun sa Malacanang, very attentive, very differential, almost si Marcos Jr., at least dun sa mga pictures na nakita natin, almost like a protege lending his ear to an old mentor. Ganon yung labas dun sa mga photos or optics na nakita natin. Now, obviously, the details were not provided about the so-called good advice that President Duterte provided to his successor. Uh, a success successor that he so much respects that he doesn't bother to attend any of his sona so far. Nakadalawang State of the Nation address na si Marcos Jr. So far, wala pa rin attendance from his immediate predecessor. Eh, si Estrada, erap na nga, nandun pa rin eh. Uh, of course, Arroyo. Now, balikan natin ito. Uh, we see here that, uh, well, it looks like yung intervention ni Tatay Digong in terms of making Philippine-China relations any better, I'm not sure how's that working because kung tinignan natin itong uh, sitwasyon sa West Philippine Sea, once again, parang lumalala. No? As uh, the report suggests by the Philippine Coast Guard, over the weekend, once again, I think at least third time in the past few months, especially since the Philippines ramped up its defense cooperation with the United States, nakikita natin na binubuli na naman ang Pilipinas. Kaya nga, parati ko sinisabi, itong uh, friends to all, enemy to none. This kind of uh, kind of a national security doctrine by the Marcos and Duterte administration, this is more appropriate just to be nice about it. I mean, this is... This is more about Mr. Congeniality. I mean, if you perhaps in a in a tourism campaign or a beauty pageant, it's it's great to say you're friends to all and enemy to none. But as far as foreign policy is concerned, uh, you need something more robust than that. At yun yung talagang kulang dun sa friends to all, enemy to none. Because you cannot be friends to those who don't act like friends, but actually act like bullies, or those who say they want to be friends with you and they want the best for your bilateral relations, but treat you hor horribly. No. <laughs> Now, we can talk a lot about shortcomings of the United States throughout the decades. First, of course, as a colonizer of the Philippines. Let's not forget that. There were horrible things that happened at the turn of the 20th century. Marami rin pagkakulang ang, China, ang U.S. sa Pilipinas pagdating sa kanyang aliansa. But today, it's not the United States which is colonizing or bullying the Philippines. Today, it's the United States that is providing, uh, among very few countries out there, robust defense assistance, development assistance. So, please lang, I don't want to hear about what about is them. Oh, what about what U.S. did in, I don't know, in Afghanistan or Iraq? Well, I'm, I'm talking about Philippine national interest. I'm talking about what's happening in the South China Sea. We can have a long discussion about Western interventions and all of the hypocrisies behind the interventions in the Middle East. We can talk about the horrible withdrawal from Afghanistan. We can talk about the human cost of Iraq war. Sure, we're not denying that. Even President Obama was among top American officials who said, who essentially said the invasion of Iraq was a dumb war. And I think a lot of our friends in the West would agree that the withdrawal from Afghanistan was horrible. But none of this in any way or form or shape justifies what's happening right now in the South China Sea or what we call the West Philippine Sea, meaning areas of the South China Sea Basin that fall within the Philippines' exclusive economic zone and extended continental shelf. And clearly, when you're talking about Low tide elevations, non-islands, low tide elevations, whether this is Mischief Reef or Panganiban Reef or Ayungin or the Second Thomas Shoal, these are very much within the Philippines continental shelf. And that's why the Philippines claims that these ones are very much an extension of the Philippine territory. And yet, it's not the United States. It's not NATO expansion, which is threatening the Philippines. Let's just be very clear about this, especially yung mga alam natin dyan. Um, it's a supposed great friend of former President Duterte who invited him as a quote-unquote special guest not long ago which is doing these things. I mean, that's why I'm saying the friends to all, enemy to none doesn't make sense in geopolitics. It's a tourism campaign slogan. It's not a national security slogan. 
So I really suggest that the Marcos Jr. administration comes up with something better, something more original. By the way, uh, you know, I have a new book coming out on ASEAN and China relations. Uh, it has been in the works for quite some time. Um, actually, if you look at it, the roots of the friends to all enemy do not is actually from Singapore. It's not even original from the previous administration. So I really suggest President Marcos Jr. to come up with some new slogan that is not so touristy and Mr. Congeniality, but something that is more realistic, more robust, and in tune with the realities that we're facing right now in our relations with our biggest well, now a neighbor, uh, so-called, well, now so-called neighbor, uh, China, because, well, we don't have direct uh, borders, supposedly, with China. We only got direct borders with them because they expanded well into the West Philippine Sea. And Taiwan, last time I checked, is a self-ruling island. But going back to this, what are the implications here? So this is where the statement by Defense Secretary Gibochador is extremely, extremely important. Because not long after the meeting between Marcos Jr., and President Duterte. And we can easily guess any content of the meeting between President Duterte and Marcos. There was no official transcript that came out in the same way that there was absolutely no transparency or official transcript that came out of the meeting between Duterte and paramount leader of China, Xi Jinping. I call him paramount leader because, you know, just calling him president is not technically correct. He's way more than that. Um, but we can guess that it was really about one thing more than anything else, and that's the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, particularly the expanded version of that under Marcos Jr. So what's interesting is that if you look at the first few months of Marcos Jr., and a lot of amateur analysts, not really expert, uh, pretentious academics try to be experts on the Philippines, and they said, oh, if Marcos wins, Philippines is going to go, blah, blah, blah. Well, I always said, you can look at my works last year, just when Marcos Jr. won, you can, you can look at my interview with Christian Amantour, which is there. Even before elections, I said, no, things are going to be different than Marcos Jr. This is based on my understanding of the Marcos and state of affairs. Now, if you look at that, early on, China was very optimistic that it will have a so-called new golden era of bilateral relations with the Philippines. This is literally what, well, now, once again, Foreign Minister of China, Wang Yi, of course, you know what's going on with China. Suddenly, so they have a foreign secretary, minister, and the next thing you know, he's expunged from the website. Next thing you know, he's back in the website. Anyway, China is China. Now, going back to this, actually early on, China was hoping to have a new golden era with the Philippines. I think it's not that no new golden era of bilateral relations with the Philippines. And then President Marcos Jr. also chose China as his first foreign destination. He went to China, but he really didn't get much out of it. Uh, no major concessions in the West Philippines, in South China Sea. No major concessions, but that things are big ticket investments. So Marcos comes back and says, you know what? Maybe we have to strengthen our relations with the U.S. instead in the West. And let's, let's see. That's better for us. It gives us leverage. So he moved accordingly. So since February of this year, the, the Philippines has ramped up its defense cooperation with its traditional allies. Not only the United States, but also Japan. I talked about JAFUS, Japan, Philippine, U.S. alliance, trilateral alliance. There's also growing defense cooperation with, with India, with Western nations, in Europe, for instance, with Australia, with South Korea, on and on and on. So suddenly China is not so central and bilateral relations are not so golden, right? Now it looks like China is not very happy about this. So we clearly see over the past five to six months, partly thanks to the greater assertiveness of the Philippine Coast Guard under its current leadership, Major Moore, friendly to China, the previous leadership, but the current leadership of the Philippine Coast Guard and the current Philippine government leadership are very much more open to pointing out yung or bullying that's happening in the West Philippine Sea. So we see over and over again that there are reports from Philippine Coast Guard of swarming of uh, Filipino claimed or occupied uh, islands or territories. We also saw yung pointing of laser military grade laser don't some philippine coast guard vessels earlier this year so clearly china is hoping that digong yung mga ganyan mga tao will help them to convince marco jr to take a softer stance perhaps on the south china sea and also recalibrate yung etka at the same time we also see that china is also ramping up pressure so they're doing both things at the same time backdoor diplomacy Suppose it's all about friendship, suppose it's all about investments, at the same time ramping up the tensions, no? Ramping up yung, yung uh, assertiveness nila sa West Philippine Sea at ito yung mga harassment nila sa Philippine Coast Guard. So they're doing this, right? Now, after the intervention by Duterte, the question was, will Marcos now recalibrate sa ETCA in order to please 
not only China but also a key ally because the Turks are still influential and powerful. And this is where you should say kudos to Defense Secretary Gilbert Chodoro and of course kudos to President Marco Jr. for choosing someone like him. Remember, Gibo was asked by former President Duterte to be his defense secretary. He turned it down. And his excuse was, you know, he started the politics, he wants to be in private sector, but you can you can guess why he didn't want to be the defense secretary of Duterte and perhaps he had good reasons. Now going back to Gibo Chidoro, as you know, Gibo Chidoro uh, is a Harvard trained lawyer. He actually passed the bar in New York, so he effectively can as far as I'm concerned, you can practice law in the United States if you pass the bar. So brilliant guy, very smart guy. Uh, you know, I may not agree with him politically and everything like that, and people under which he ran in the past, but he's his own man. He's an independent-minded man. He's a smart guy, and he's, he shares the wavelength of the president, and, and he very much also understands what is good for the country. So, tellingly, just few days after the Marcos Duterte meeting Malacanang, Gibo Chudoro, the defense secretary of the Philippines, comes out and says, Walang pake dapat yung ibang bansa. In short, other nations have no business questioning what we do with our own bases under our own defense agreements with other countries, enhanced defense cooperation agreement. It was a very polite or indirect way of saying, sorry China, sorry proxies of China, you're not gonna essentially pressure us into reconsidering what we do with our own bases. And Gabriel Chodora has been very clear about two things. First of all, the ETCA is not about compromising Philippine sovereignty and selling us out to US as some of our Western friends with 1950s, 1960s, 20th century style of arguments and thinking keep on saying. Um, his argument is no, this is, this is about confluence of interest between the Philippines and US. Both countries have shared interests in the region. They are treaty allies. There is a mutual defense treaty and that the ETCA could actually serve as a springboard for the modernization of the armed forces and the capabilities of the armed forces of the Philippines on multiple fronts, including non-traditional security issues like disaster relief and humanitarian assistance, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operation, HADR, and more importantly, in terms of territorial defense. So in Sinisabi ni Gubo is, we need ETCA because not only does this not undermine our sovereignty, it helps us to better protect our sovereignty and protect our people and take care of our people. So he sees EDCA as a springboard for modernization of the Philippines' defensive and non-traditional security capabilities. And number two, and this is, what's, this is where the, the importance of his statements about no, his argument is the fact that some of these EDCA sites, new EDCA sites in Cagayan, in Isabela are a bit close to Taiwan. Not so close, as, as I said. If, if you really want to go to uh, close to Taiwan, we're talking about bases like in Fuga or Mavulis. Those ones are really close to Taiwan, and those are not part of EDCA. And American troops have no presence there, and as last time I checked, they're not being given any presence there, uh, permitted any kind of presence there. What it's saying is this. If you look at yung mga bases na malapit sa Taiwan, relatively malapit, a, Marcus Jr. said they will never be used for offensive purposes, meaning U.S. cannot use those bases to launch attacks on, let's say, Chinese troops attacking Taiwan, something like that. And, and B, it's just a geographic accident na malapit sila sa Taiwan. Now, we can have an argument about this. For me, absolutely, there is a relevance for the Taiwan aspect. I think President Marcus Jr. himself, if you read in between the lines, or sometimes even more than that, uh, you'll realize that what Marcus is saying is that we need a strong alliance with the U.S., vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan because we need to deter it. I call that proactive deterrence. And I said it has to be at the Goldilocks level. Not too much to be pro provocative, but not too minimal to be irrelevant to the Taiwan situation. Because if, ta if war breaks out in Taiwan, Philippines is affected regardless of what rhetorical friends to all, enemy to none, nonsense positioning we make. No, we cannot be neutral. Allies cannot be neutral. Philippines is a US ally. It will be targeted inevitably in a Taiwan war situation. So if you get the honest opinion of a lot of officials, they know that EDCA has a deterrence aspect to it. But the degree to which it will be directly and substantially involved and central to American counter operations against a potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan in the coming years, I think that's up for grabs. I think that's up for negotiations. We can tweak that. The devil is in the details, right? And the details are very much not coming in so far because I, I, I very much know that if you talk about Marcus Jr., he wants to have the cake and eat it too on this front. Now, 
there's also a kind of a credence to the argument that being close to Taiwan doesn't mean it's about Taiwan per se. For me, it has a relevance to Taiwan, but it's also true, as you can see in my interviews with uh, some of the top defense officials, former admirals uh, in the Philippines, you check out our show, uh, The View from Manila with TV5, Signal News, One News. Um, there is a relevance because Isabel and Cagayan are also close to Benham Rice, relatively again. They're close to the Philippine Sea. They embrace the Philippine Sea, where China is also having more and more submarine and other kinds of presence. And the Philippine defensive capabilities are close to zero in that area, right? Most of our, most of our defensive capabilities, whatever, how, no matter how humble they are, are concentrated in two theaters, towards South China Sea and towards the whole tri-border with Malaysia and Indonesia because of the, of course, counter-terrorism concerns, right? So, katulad ng sinabi ng isang top officials, parang bulag daw tayo, or very limited yung capabilities natin when it comes to the Philippine Sea to the Western Pacific area. So, the EDCA can help the Philippines. At least this is the argument you hear from a lot of top officials, military officials. The EDCA can help the Philippines to better also deal with the threats we're facing there, or at least develop basic domain awareness, ISR, uh, reconnaissance, surveillance capacity, intelligence gathering capacity there. So, again, I think to say EDCA is completely relevant to Taiwan is not very tenable. But to say that it's all about Taiwan and provoking China is also an untenable argument. It's even a more ridiculous argument. And I think it's, it's fair to say that Marcos Jr. is trying his best to make sure the EDCA doesn't become a springboard for American military operation against China and doesn't become too provocative. And at the same time, the EDCA could also be a springboard for strengthening and modernizing the Philippine armed forces, right? Or at least this is the hope of the Marcos Jr. administration and the current defense established in the Philippines. Whether they can fulfill this effectively over the coming years, I'm not gonna vouch for that. I mean, our history with the United States, I'm not just blaming one side. The reality is that the Philippine-US alliance has not created a very modern armed forces capability for the Philippines. You can blame the Philippines, you can blame US, whatever, but we know the weaknesses in the Philippines, corruption, lack of proper prioritization, lack of leadership, whatever, sure. But on the part of US, we're talking about a country that has given billions of dollars of aid to countries like Jordan and Pakistan, or not even a US ally. And as far as the Philippines is concerned, what are the most advanced armaments that we got from America? What, are, what was the most advanced fighter jet we got from the US? So I think there's some legitimate criticism to be made of the US in terms of how helpful it has been to modernization of the Philippines over the past three, four decades, aside from giving us you know, Vietnam era choppers and some snipers here and there. I mean, fantastic, great. But I think the Philippine-US alliance really has to level up if it wants to be relevant to the 21st century. It takes two to tango. The Philippines has to do its own assignment. But the US has to take the Philippines more seriously and has to appreciate the relevance of the Philippines and the urgency of developing the Philippines' capabilities. All right? So that's why this is important, because it just reinforces this argument that as much as Marcos and Duterte want to show a common front, there seems to be, at least on foreign policy, which is quite an important front, seems to be some fundamental disagreement. Duterte will try to keep on criticizing Etka and essentially toe the Chinese line on this. But as far as Marcos Jr. is concerned, or at least statements by his defense chief are concerned, the Philippines will stay its course and will continue with this Etka. Will it be a maximal Etka, an Etka heavy version, or will it be an Etka light? That is still up for grabs. And that's why important thing, yung tulong ng US sa, Amer sa Pilipinas, yung relasyon ng Amerika sa Pilipinas, yung mga packages of aid and security assurances that the U.S. provides to the Philippines. And as far as assurances are concerned, at least rhetorically, very clear yung sinabi ng U.S. State Department today, uh, uh, in, in sorry, yesterday, in response to the latest harassment that happened in the Philippine waters in the South China Sea. So again, huh, this is very clear. So I'll just show you this again, especially those who are, you know, yung mga nakikinig sa mga disinformation um, so I'm talking about US today not Obama era this is what they said okay the United States affirms an armed attack on Philippine public vessels aircraft and armed forces this is the important part that comes next including those of its coast guards in the South China Sea would invoke US mutual defense commitments under article 4 of the 1951 US Philippines mutual defense treaty so in short if China were to attack or coercively punish 
any of the Philippine Coast Guard, not only Philippine Navy or Philippine aircraft or Philippine soldiers or Philippine warships, then automatically mutual defense treaty will apply. The U.S. has been crystal clear about this under the Biden administration and also towards the end of the Trump administration, essentially since 2019, consistent in U.S. veto. So I think a lot of criticisms about U.S. not being clear enough with its commitments. That is absolutely correct from Nixon all the way to uh, Obama. But towards the end of Trump and now under Biden, very clear in U.S. about the parameters of its defense commitment in the Philippines. And this is important. And the U.S. reiterating this consistently every time there's a harassment case is important. And remember, what happened, the latest one, was water cannon bullying or blocking resupply. But so far, thank God, there has been no skirmishes, armed skirmishes. Once that happens, the U.S. has made it clear. We're going to talk about mutual defense treaty act activations and there'll be a response from the U.S. All right? Okay, thank you very much again for, for your kind comments and suggestions. As I said, you cannot understand Philippine foreign policy without understanding domestic politics, and you cannot also understand the Duterte Marcos dynamics without understanding the foreign policy front. All right? So these are the things that we are, uh, we're keeping in mind. So we have some couple of questions coming from our friends here. Ray Wolf said the five ways to deal with the bully. He said the class stands and watches. Class miss watch, but slides weapons to the kid getting his... Uh, rear kick the bigger class bully steps in the teacher said okay so yeah okay so i think we're having some mma <laughs> discussions here alexi has a question he said is it true that the harassment of ccg now even was calculated yes as i, I was saying this is also part of uh, china saying to the Philippines, we're not happy about etka and they're hoping that with the combination of backdoor diplomacy via duterte and their their friends in the philippines and also uh via this kind of actions in the uh, south china sea they were able to uh, shape and then essentially, you know, make Marcos think twice about building his secure relationship with the U.S. But so far, it's actually backfiring. And this is where I can see how China is not very sophisticated in terms of its foreign policy. Perhaps if China bothered to ask real experts, not just some tier two propagandists, etc., but actually real experts, they would have given them a good advice that what you're doing is actually making the situation worse. And as much as you may think that Marcos Jr. is not tough enough, well, he is surrounded by tough guys, including Gibo Chodoro, right? Who are very clear-minded and clear-eyed about what's important for the Philippines. Again, thank you very much for those comments. I really, really appreciate it. Let's continue these discussions. I have an article coming, on, coming up on this very issue. I will be posting it soon. Talk to you guys soon. Very much appreciate it. Salamat. Salamat. Thank you also here. Dun sa mga kametas natin. Salamat kay Tessie Gomez. Noemi Tablada. Yeah, thank you very much again. Kept it close. Uh, kept it tight. My came on Joseph Lumberio, Brad Pitt, Jov, Numeran, yeah, Eunice, Babal, Babalcon. Thank you very much, ma'am. Madrigal Heya. Yeah, and my usual suspect. Thank you very much. And by the way, also don't forget to drop by our lecture soon. I posted the details about that, our public lecture. I hope to see you guys soon. And I have to go to my next meeting. Marami salamat. Thank you very much.